Yeah, my name is Kwame Dawes. I'm a professor at the University of Nebraska. I've just been here for about just under two years. Mm -hmm. I'm also the Glenna Lucia editor of Prairie Schooner. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm a writer and a poet. So I was born in Ghana, in West Africa, grew up in Jamaica. I've lived in the States for a number of years. I lived in South Carolina for about 19 years before moving to, to Nebraska. And I did high school in Jamaica, at the Jamaica College, and then went on to do my undergraduate degree uh, at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. Um, I eventually, I began my, my master's program in Jamaica and then moved to Canada where I did a PhD in, um, in English literature at the University of New Brunswick. And so that was the end of my formal education as far as I can tell anyway. You never know what I'll take on later on. Um, in terms of the influences that have have affected my own development as a writer, I can say that um, it's it's been an interesting progression because I've been influenced by the work from the different places where I've lived. Okay. Um, and when I moved to the states, one of the first things I did was to to become more acquainted with um, American writing and American literature. Um, and so the truth is that I, I, it was during that period that I encountered somebody like Ted Kuzo's work. And um, as a poet, that, that seemed to be very, that was influential to me and that meant something to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, can't, I can't say that I thought of him as a Nebraska writer. I, uh, frankly, I just thought of him as a, a great American poet. Mm -hmm. um, so coming to Nebraska was a very interesting experience to see the landscapes he, he'd written about, um, to see the people that he was writing about. Um, and frankly, it would be Ted Kuzer that, that would be the most dominant figure in terms of Nebraska influences. Having come here, of course, it's been interesting to, to, to read um, um, other writers and to, to, to become more acquainted with the, the space and the landscape. And, and the good news is that I've already started writing poems that have been influenced by this landscape. Right, my writing has been shaped by and probably motivated by the writers that I've read. I think the poet that stands out to me as, as an early, uh, and influence is probably not the word, but an early challenge and therefore um, somebody who the excitement of reading his work made me want to create work of, you know, in a similar vein uh, was Gerald Manley Hopkins, who I, who I studied in, in, in school. Um, but at the same time, I, I was very much interested in, in many African writers, um, whether it was Kofi Owona or Wole Shoyinka, um, Athol Fugard, um, and Amate Edu, Buche Mecheta. These are writers that I found very exciting and interesting. Um, and in the Caribbean, of course, Derek Walcott is a, is a, is a, is a looming and, and I think presence, a kind of um, a, a challenge for me as a writer, but also a, a, a conduit, a, a space. Um, for, 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 for giving me confidence and giving me a sense of the possibility in what one can do as a writer. So in that vein, Derek Walcott, Kamau Brathwaite, uh, Lorna Goodison are all poets that I've been, you know, I continue to return to. Um, but I think one of the most striking influences, and it's one that writers I think don't talk enough about, has been popular culture. And in my case, it would be the work of Bob Marley and reggae music, um, the lyrics of Bob Marley. Um, and I think those would be seminal and very influential and defining. And since then, I've come to, to be fascinated by other singer-songwriters, jo Jonah Matradin, um, Bob Dylan, Paul Simon. Um, I continue to regard them as, as, as interesting and influential writers to me as, as any poet or any, any fiction writer. Well, those are two very different occasions. The question of whether when I started writing and when I began to call myself a writer, um, they're strikingly different articulations. Um, I can talk about when I started writing in retrospect. Uh, and, and I think it, it, one invents these narratives um, because they, they fit into a, a useful answer to a question. Uh, the, the, the truth is that growing up in Ghana, we, we did not have television, um, not because 
there was no TV in Ghana, but my father just didn't want us to have a television. Um, so we, 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 we entertained ourselves by reading a lot. And, and consequently, if we ran out of books to read, we began to write little stories to each other and entertain ourselves. And this was not being precocious. This was just being, you know, this was as exciting and as innovative as digging holes and, and, and burying ourselves in there. So, 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 so we, we wrote um, to, 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 to entertain ourselves. And, um, and, and I have to say that that must have been influential for me. Um, but I think the, the, the lesson in that was that I was driven to write those stories, and we were all driven to write those stories, because we wanted to replicate the experience of reading, reading the material. I think the second sort of defining influence for me had nothing to do with literature per se, but had to do with the fact that I, I began to be a, an avid pen pal writer. Um, and this was when I was living in Jamaica. I had pen pals from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, I found a very uh, rich and exciting um, uh, challenge in, the, in the, the business of conveying to somebody who did not know anything about my world, did not know anything about my country, um, in, in, in language. I, was ha I had to convey to them a sense of my world. Um, and that filled me both with a sense of, of, of intimidation at the task, but a tremendous level of excitement at the power that, that is contained in that. Um, and I think that instinct of trying to, 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 to bring somebody else into the world, my world, um, through language, that is, to me, the most dominant instinct that hasn't changed since then. So um, it may well be that being, a, being an avid pen pal writer is, the, is the, the single most defining influence on me as a writer, because the impulse is the same. I was about 17 or 18 when I began to sort of write poems, um, imitation poems, we were imitating Hopkins and so on. Um, and I think it's at that point that the question of whether I would continue to do this or not became important. And, and it turned out that where my, my friends, my schoolmates and friends, who were just as talented as far as I could tell, and some even more talented in writing, um, where they went on to be more useful things like lawyers and doctors and so on, I, I, I pursued writing um, as something that I needed to do and I was drawn to. Um, and this is despite sort of um, major obstacles and, 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 and blows in the way. Um, the thing that saved me as a writer when I was about 18 was when I started writing plays. And, and those plays were staged, and I became known for the next 10 years as a playwright. Okay. I did not call myself a poet until my third book of poetry was published. Before that, I called myself somebody who wrote poetry, <laughs> which, is, which means quite different things. <laughs> yeah. okay. One of the reasons why I like to explain that writing was inextricably tied for me to to, to reading mm -hmm. is that I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm skeptical of the precocious idea of being a writer. Somebody at 12 saying, I'm going to be a writer. Now, this has happened. I think Ted Kuzo's story is that at 12 years old or 13 or 14, it dawned on him that it would be really cool to be a writer. He'd get girls and so on. I, I, and I understand that. That's why I was going to be a big athlete anyway. Um, so. We, we make our choices for, for our hormones, right? But I think that's a, that's a little different from, from the drive. I think the, the, it's important to say that if you are engaged by reading and engaged by the work that you read, um, then the impulse is to recreate that experience for other people. Mm -hmm. um, why does one person become a writer and another? I don't know. My, my, all my siblings wrote as children. None of them would say that they're they are, they are, they are writers at this point. They appreciate literature. They teach literature. They do all kinds of things. They appreciate what I do. But I don't think any of them have felt the absolute need to do this thing, this, this strange compulsion. Um, so it's, it's really impossible to tell. My father was a writer, and um, he had that compulsion. And I can't say it's because my father did, because if that was the case, then all my siblings would be writers. My mother is an artist, and I became an artist. But writing, I think I did better. So, um, so it, it's, it's, it's really hard to tell what, 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 what goes into it. But once you're in it, you might as well do it well. This is my view, anyway. Yeah. 
um, I, I think I can only understand them in retrospect. So, so I, I see myself and I, I look at the body of work that I've written. I've written quite a lot of work. Um, and then I try to see whether there are elements that seem to recur and they seem to be themes or ideas that come up and so on. Um, I, I think there's, there, there's one thing that is consistently true. I'm interested in stories. I'm interested in, in the idea of story. Um, and I think there's a, there's a full, rich, and complex poetic tradition that is about story. In fact, I think all poetry is about story, although many poets would, would hate me for saying that, but, but that's their problem. Um, I think the idea of, of containing within language the moment, a, a moment that is fascinating and that is interesting and that is compelling, and that moment may be a few seconds or that moment, moment may contain a century, um, in language and in poetry and in drawing from it all the kinds of possibilities that are there. I think that's the impulse. I think that's the idea for story. And story seems to be something that, that helps me to define myself um, as a teacher, as, a, as an editor, as a, as, a, as a writer of fiction, as a writer of plays, as a writer of poems. I am interested in story. I'm interested in, 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 the, in, in the way that we understand ourselves through story. The second thing that seems to be consistently there is, mm -hmm. is um, a passion for, for the human experience. To, I'm, I'm interested in, in people. Um, some would call it, I'm a gossip. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm inherently excited about discovering things about people and understanding those things about people. And the last thing is mm -hmm. something that happens to me when I read, which is the moment of illumination. There's something visceral. I think, I think um, some writers would, would, would call it, um, you know, just a, you know, a, sh a shot of, 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 of epiphany, a kind of moment where something hits you and, and, and pleases you and excites you. Um, Emily Dickinson says, you know, the idea of, the, you know, your head being blown off the top, that, that, that whole idea. Um, and it's addictive. It's something that you, you look for, you get excited when it happens. Um, and then it becomes more difficult to create it. But, but when you write and it happens to you, while you're writing, then that's, that's a very exciting thing. So for me, that moment of illumination, that moment of epiphany, that moment of the mysterious unfolding in, in exciting ways um, is also part of the impulse and part of what I'm, I'm seeking every time that I sit down to write. Okay. I do not have a set time that I work. Um, I, I, I do not have uh, a routine. Um, the, the, the routine I have has to do with the moment when I'm going to write. The, the moment I'm going to write, um, I don't know what I'm going to write about necessarily. I have a, a, a feeling, I have an, an, an image, I have a, an idea, um, and then I, what happens is that when I write, I am actually discovering what my poem is about. I'm discovering the idea that I'm going for. Um, and, and the ritual for me is trusting that. I trust that and because it has happened again and again. Um, it depends on what I'm writing. If I'm writing poems, I'll write poems anywhere and at any time. I mean, this is because I can. I can take a pen, I can, I can jot down lines and so on and so forth. Um, when I'm writing fiction, I tend to need a good chunk of time. I need maybe an hour to sort of have some momentum. Um, and the same thing is true of nonfiction. Um, and with plays, I find it very interesting that I usually start plays if I enjoy starting my plays while sitting on a stage, uh, a physical stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's a weird thing, but it seems to work well for me because I, I'm always aware of. I think the, the thing about theater, writing for theater, is to be aware of the theater. If you, if you don't write for the space, you don't write for the idea of the space, mm -hmm. then you're writing something else. You, you know, you're, 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 you're not necessarily writing plays that are going to be um, easily staged. Um, and there's a long tradition of, of playwrights, particularly in the 18th century, um, that wrote, you know, people like Dryden. You, nobody can stage Dryden's plays. They were, they were not written for the stage. They were, they were written to be read. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Um, and and I'm, I'm not into that business. I'm, if I'm doing a play, it, it's got to it's gotta go on stage. Yeah. The question of my audience is a very difficult and tricky question because, because I think I've, I've, I think what I've done in my writing is to create a separation between the writing process 
and the publishing process. And by publishing, I don't just mean putting it in a book or putting it in, a, in an anthology and so on, or a journal. By publishing, I mean the making public of the work, which is what I'm sharing with somebody, I'm reading it to somebody else, or I'm, I'm handing it to somebody, or any of the other um, means that I describe publishing it somewhere. And I separate those two things, because um, the, and, and I think the audience question only arises for me in the latter part. In other words, the question becomes then, who is going to read this? Who, how do I get this out to those people? Um, do I do it on a video? Do I do it with music? Do I do it in a book form? Um, who reads this book? Um, do, I, do I do readings? Do I visit different? All of those questions then introduce the issue of audience. But while I'm writing, I try not to think about any of that. You know, what I'm trying to do when I'm writing is to, is to capture the idea that seems to be haunting me and to try and, and, and and, and elevate my, my craft and my use of language to meet that idea, to capture it as effectively as possible. Um, when that happens, then I can decide what happens to the work. Sometimes it means I put it away and it's not seen again, or sometimes it means I can send it to this place or that place, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So, so audience doesn't affect, I don't think of audience while I'm actually sitting down to write. At least I don't think I do. <laughs> I don't know what my subconscious is, conscience is doing, but I don't consciously think of doing that. Um, but I do think of audience once, once we enter the, the, the realm of, of publishing in the most generic sense of that term. Okay. For somebody who is interested in writing and wants to write, um, there are a number of things that I, I could say. I mean, I, I could, I, I have, I have no shortage of, of advice, you know. Um, in fact, uh, on Twitter, I have had, you know, over 120 tips for poets. Um, um, and and they're, qu they're quite funny, I suspect, but they're also quite serious. Um, but but I, I would say that the most important thing is to decide whether you're in this thing for the long haul or not. This is, this is a very important question. And that, that question is not answered by the extent to which you're successful or not. It's answered by the compulsion that drives you to do this. Mm -hmm. if, if, if it is uncomfortable to you to live without writing, then that is one part of that answer. Then it means that we, we OK, so we have a situation here where, which is true of most writers, which is a chronic condition. And now one must contend with that chronic condition. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so the second thing to do is to ask yourself, not so much why you want to write, but why you why you, you read, what, what drives you to read, what, 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 what motivates you as a reader. And why is that question important? The question is important simply because um, when you write, you are expecting other people to read you. And, and you have to ask yourself, what gives you the temerity or the audacity to think that your words should be published, you know, 3,000 copies of it and distributed to people who are going to pay for this? This is, this is, this is hubris at the, at, the most, at the most basic level. So, so, so one has to ask the, the really difficult question, which is, but, 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 but also exciting question is, what is driving me to read? What excites me about reading? And as I understand what excites me about reading, I will seek to to replicate that experience for the writer. Mm -hmm. If we understand that, I think we're well driven. The final thing that I would say, which is really, really most important, is to realize that the condition of the writer is consistently and, 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 and almost always a, a condition of, of, of failure. <clears throat> and, I, and I should explain what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, the, the task of writing is to, is to take an idea or to have an idea. And ideas are a dime a dozen. Anybody has ideas. You can go on the street and talk to somebody and they have the best ideas for a novel or for a poem and so on. Everybody has great ideas. The difference between the person who has an idea and the person who is a writer is the writer has craft. The writer knows how to use language to capture, to, to encapsulate, to, to make alive that idea. But the writer is faced with the gap between their craft, that is their ability, and the idea, which is a lofty idea. Mm -hmm. And craft and the work of craft, the labor of craft, which is to, to your diction, your rhythm, your, your understanding form, understanding all of these things, is what elevates your craft to meet your idea.
So writers will write poems and they will see that gap because we live in that gap and that gap is frustrating but that gap is the gap of failure yes mm -hmm. however what we are trying to do is to make it closer and closer now if a writer understands that that is always going to be the gap and the way to ease the frustration of that gap is to improve one's craft and do the work to improve one's craft then you're in a good state if you don't realize this then i think you're, you're actually going to be deluded about what you're doing as a writer. Okay. Um, the things that I'm working on currently um, have, have le less to do with my own work uh, because my own work continues without, you know, it never stops. I'm constantly working on things and, um, and, and I don't tend to talk much about my work until it's done because I, I, I'm superstitious. I think I'll jinx it. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but I do know that I plan to continue to write poems. And I've been writing poems um, quite steadily. Um, and, and, and the work that I've been doing has been in very interesting dialogue with other poets. Um, so I've been in dialogue with Seamus Haney. I've been in dialogue with Joe Shapcott, um, Levina Greenwall, Green, Greenlaw. These are writers from all over the world. Um, I'm, I've done a really interesting dialogue with, um, with Ted Kuz's work. And this doesn't mean I'm talking to them. I'm actually just writing poems in response to their work. And when the poems are published, nobody will know that that's what I'm doing. But it's a way for me to, 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 to challenge myself and to test myself. But the things that really excite me are the work that I'm doing um, with, with other writers, um, with promoting the work of other writers. And my current preoccupation and passion is the African Poetry Book Foundation and fund that, that I established um, just within a year ago uh, with a commitment to publish four books of poetry each year by an African poet, um, as well as a, a chapbook um, box set of seven African poets. And, and in, within the the space of a year and a half, we've managed mm -hmm. to see that come to, to fruition. By next mm -hmm. year, we'll be seeing two new books of poetry by African poets, plus a seven, seven chapbook box set. Um, we're going to put set up poetry libraries in uh, you know different parts of Africa, mm -hmm. and and it's simply a response to a, a sad reality that so few publishers and the, in fact they never they, they hadn't existed until we started this. A single po um, poetry press devoted exclusively to African poetry um, which which is absurd when you when you think about it um, and so this this we hope is going to make the difference we've also um, signed contracts to you know not signed contracts but signed agreements to to put together a major contemporary African poetry anthology um, and and a number of other projects that I think are, are really exciting and the other excitement to me is is a, is a new anthology that Northwestern Press has agreed to publish which would be poets African-American poets Responding to the art of um, uh, of Romare Bearden, um, a wonderful sequence mm -hmm. called the Odyssey sequence, mm -hmm. and um, and this has, I mean, the poets who are in this anthology, who have agreed to it and who have already started to send the work, is a stunning, is a, it's, it's a stellar. It could, Yusuf Komenyaka, Rita Dove, um, Nate Mackey, uh, just just anybody who 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 is a major African American poet in this country has agreed to do it. And and, and is sending us work. So we are very excited about that, and I'm editing that um, as well. So, so I'm very excited about that work. I'm excited about the work that I do with Prairie Schooner. It's a great journal, and um, anything that helps me to, to promote and to give voice to the work of other writers is, excites me, quite frankly. Uh, I, I can be passionate about that. Well, today, um, today is a very important day for me because yesterday this book came in the, in the mail. This is my new book, New and Selected, Doppy Conqueror. So this is, this is a brand new book. Um, it's published by Copper Canyon Press, um, and it's, it's a new and selected works um, which, which contains some of the, all, some, something from all my, I think, 16 collections of poetry, plus some brand new work. Um, and it's, it was edited by Matthew Shinoda, a wonderful um, Egyptian-American poet and a dear friend of mine, and we worked together on this. Um, so, so today I will read from, 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 from Doppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems, and um, I was told to make sure that I promote it, so I'm promoting it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good afternoon.
My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room, and I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room today and to the John H. James Reading Series. We're excited that this reading series has been around for more than 25 years, and this is the 206th reading. So thanks for joining us. We are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. It is a special collection dedicated to promoting and preserving works by and about Nebraska authors. It's a representative collection, uh, more than 13,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 Nebraska authors. Um, we also have information files, magazines, pictures. If you look around the room, you'll see some artwork and some memorabilia from Nebraska authors too. Um, and by the way, the Heritage Room is not tax supported. It's supported by the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association, and we would like to thank the NLHA for the endowment that they established a number of years ago through their volunteer efforts. And we'd also like to thank those who have contributed to the, the Heritage Room Endowment Fund during uh, several recent campaigns. We do invite you to come to the Heritage Room during our regular public service hours. We're open Tuesday through Friday from 12 to 3. and. We're, Incidentally, open on Sundays from 2 to 5, so we are featuring this Ames reading in the middle of our, our regular public service hours on Sunday. Um, Channel 5, um, 5 City TV films the Ames readings, and if you're not here today watching, but you're watching on Channel 5, we are located on the third floor of Bennett Martin Public Library at 14th and N Streets in downtown Lincoln. Um, we're also pleased that the more recent Ames readings are now available through 5 City TV um, uh, video on demand, so you could watch them anywhere in the world, I think. Um, our reader today is Kwame Dawes. He was born in Ghana, grew up in Jamaica, and was educated at Jamaica College, the University of the West Indies, and the University of New Brunswick, where he earned his PhD. He taught for a number of years at the University of South Carolina, and he's a cur he is currently the Glenn Alushai editor of Prairie Schooner, and he's a UNL Chancellor's Professor of English. He recently received a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. The fellowship will support his work on the poem cycle August, a quintet, based on the work of August Wilson, an American playwright and a Pulitzer Prize winner whose work illustrated the African American experience in the 20th century. Kwame is also an award-winning author with some 16 books of poetry and many books of nonfiction, criticism, drama, and fiction to his credit. Several of his titles include Wheels, Hope's Hospice, and Back to Mount Peace. He expects the publication of a new book, Duppy Conqueror, new and selected poems from Copper Canyon Press soon. Uh, I think he actually has it in his hand today. He might be the only person who has one in his hand right now, though. Um, so you'll definitely hear more from that later. Uh, recently, Kwame and Prairie Schooner managing editor Marianne Kunkel took a Nebraska tour, a Prairie Schooner winter 2012 library tour featuring public libraries in Alliance, Battle Creek, Beatrice, Broken Bow, Central City, Fremont, Neely, Norfolk, Omaha, Potter, Stromsburg, and South Sioux City. And we're pleased to add the Heritage Room and the Lincoln City Libraries to that list of libraries today. Uh, we're very happy to have Kwame with us today. If you could please help me welcome him, I would appreciate it. Thanks very much, Meredith. Um, Good to be here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read poems, uh, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to have a little discussion afterwards. Um, and the good news, yeah, it's very exciting. This is the new book. It just came in, my, in the mail yesterday. So. It's, it's, it's true. It's actually published. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's called Doppy Conqueror, and um, New and Selected Poems. Selected by Matthew Shinoda, a wonderful Egyptian-American poet, uh, who is a very good friend of mine. And, and he made a selection, and then we went back and forth with it and uh, put this together. And um, it, it represents uh, selections from 
for some 16 books of poetry that I've published um, over the years since 1994. Um, and it's fascinating to, 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 to read through this, not that I have, but you know, skim through it because I don't want to bore myself with, <laughs> with, my, with my poems. Um, they're good though. I mean, if you haven't read them before, I mean, you should, you know, you should at least read them. Um, but, but the interesting thing is going through this is like taking a, a, a weird journey through many landscapes and experiences um, and, and ways of seeing myself and seeing the world. Um, and so that's one of the exciting things about New and Selected. This will be my second New and Selected. The first one was published in the UK, um, and it 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 was uh, I think about six years ago. So this is this is this is the first one in the in the US. So that's very exciting. Um, and so I thought what I would do is I would read poems from 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 this. Um, but so so you have to you you know work on your imagination here. I'm going to put the book down here, and then read the poems from my thingamajig here. <laughs> And the reason is that um, I have relatively bad eyesight. And so I'd be like this if I was reading um, from this, right? And one day, they'll make all the book prints so large that I can read from my actual <laughs> books. But um, right now, I have to read from this wonderful gizmo, which was recently invented, called the iPad. And we are so grateful to all the people who put their hands and minds together to create the iPad. <laughs> I saw like a promotion for Apple. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I hope they give me a free pad for this. <laughs> um, so, so, so these are these are tricky poems. Um, so, I, in preparation, I asked that anybody coming in should be carded. Um, <laughs> some are mature, and um, but my daughter is here, so and she will not tell anybody that I read these things because she's, <laughs> she's promised not to. And any, we know who anybody is, right? <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to read poems from, 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 from this new and selected, but I'll tell you what books they are from. Um, the first few poems come from a collection called Wheels. And, and Wheels was written at a time when I was very uh, sort of I immersed in, in, um, in uh, really what was happening in the world. There were wars happening. We were going, you know, every time I traveled, I was very aware of um, of, of the wars that we were fighting because of, of the military you know, personnel that would be on the flights with me. Um, I was living in South Carolina, the, the, the great um, f um, sh um, base, the, 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 the military base, um, Fort, Fort, what's it called? Jackson. Jackson thank Shaw. you. No, Fort Jackson. Yeah, there's a million of them, right? But in, in Columbia, um, for Jackson, which is a major, 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 major training ground. Um, and so you go to the airports and you meet these kids coming in or you meet these kids going out. And so I was very aware of that. I was also aware of it because I did not have a U.S. passport at the time. And so I was constantly aware of being a potential uh, danger to, 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 to the country. My beard was bigger then. Um, <laughs> So, so these poems come out of that, 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 that preoccupation and that, that, that sense of the world being very much present. Um, the poem is called, the first poem I'll read is called Our Colossal Father Again. Sub heavy world, sub as you spin. W. H. Auden. One, the portrait painter's art work works like faith that turns the wafer, the decanter of wine, into something else. A dragon swaggers through the portal of our century, striding into a gothic sky. Two, in another country, olive groves and gleaming mosques are pulverized to dust. Outside the white courtyards Bloody streets fade after sudden explosions. Three, he is a throwback to grand lawgivers who stretched their arms over the world. We will remember him for his Augustinian self-denial and the last beer he drank and his mealy-mouthed sermons. Four, his prophets 
pour oil that rises in flood across the marbled floor. Better a good name than costly oil, the day of death than the day of birth. In the faint light of dusk, he seems to be walking on water. <clears throat> Um, the next poem is a poem about writing, but it's about writing um, in, in, in a time, in, in, in this kind of time. I would say in time of war, in time of conflict, and so on. These poems, by the way, from Wheels, are based on a dialogue with the book of Ezekiel, uh, which fascinated me for two reasons. One is the sort of prophetic, um, catastrophic uh, moments that, that generated th that book, that, that series of poems, really. Um, and the second is the African-American uh, transformation of the narrative of Ezekiel into that great um, spiritual, Ezekiel saw the wheels way up in the middle of the air. The idea of finding their own redemption in those spinning wheels, the interlocking wheels, a, a moment of profound postmodern um, uh, interpretation, which was done by, by slaves, by people who, who were trying to find meaning in their world. So Ezekiel is a very interesting book for me, and, and these poems come from that. So rituals before the poem. In terror they will drink water grudgingly, Ezekiel chapter 4. Before the poem comes like a word from a brazen sky, the poet must lie on his side for a year, eating only dry bread and bre measured bowls of water. The poet must pour sand over grass and build the, cities of the walls of his city. The poet must surround the walls with the offense of guns, and for days upon days starve the city of all its music. The poet's tongue will grow heavy, and his limbs will be bound with cords so he cannot move. He will quarrel with God about the meaning of poetry. The poet will beg for mercy, lying on his other side for a hundred and ninety days, his body scarred with the wounds he inflicts on his family. All this a poet does before a poem so that when he walks out in the midwinter, his face will be smooth, his eyes will have the quiet resignation we call peace, and his satchel will be full of whimsical lyrics about the color green and the sound a whore makes in her dreams. Uh, the next poem is uh, titled How to Pick a Hanging Tree. As was said in the introduction, and um, as some of you should know, I, 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 I lived in South Carolina for about 19 years, which is a long time. Um, and it's home in many ways and continues to be home for us. Uh, South Carolina is a, is, a, is a beautiful, complex place. This, 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 is, this is probably true about everywhere, but it seems to be more beautiful and more complex than most places. Um, and there are plantations all over South Carolina, these old plantations, and they, they are in a big business for weddings. Uh, they do wedding because people apparently like to take wedding photos at these plantations. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what, it's, I think that's a lot of gone with the wind thing, right? <laughs> um, the, and the problem, of course, with that is that there are plantations that are known to be old slave plantations. It's not, it's not even in question, right? Um, so they are really concentration camps, <laughs> when you think about it. Or at least when I think about it, so, okay, uh, which is a very specific distinction I'm maybe making. But, um, so I was there at one of those plantations, and I kept asking where the, the, the slave quarters were, and they, they, you know, it was a tour, and they kept saying, well, we, we don't do the slave quarters on the tour. Uh, it's not really, like, a very uplifting theme um, that, for, for this tour. So I kept insisting. Eventually, they sent me to the main office. Um, and I, you know, as I was going to the main office, I, I'm sure there was applause from, the, um, from the, the rest of the people who were enjoying the plantation. Um, the main office was more helpful to me. And they took me around and showed me the slave quarters and so on. And at one point, they pointed to a tree right on a canal, right at the edge of the plantation. And they said that is what they call the hanging tree. Um, so this poem is called How to Pick a Hanging Tree. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, 
scent of magnolias, sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Lewis Allen. Thank you. <laughs> Young trees may look sturdy, but they have no memory. They are green, so near the surface they bend with the sudden weight. And the truth is that not all trees can carry a man's dead weight with enough air between pointed toes and earth, with enough height so the scent of rotting can carry far enough to be a message for those who are sniffing the muggy air for news. Old as it may look, craggy bark, twisted branches, drooping limbs, old as it may seem, sitting there by the edge of the canal, that live oak understands the simple rituals of hanging. See, there is the natural notch where the rope will slip and hold, and here, angled like this, the damp air off the river carries the decay for miles and miles. Sometimes a fresh tree will simply die after the piss of a dying man seeps into its roots. Sometimes a tree will start to rot from guilt or something like a curse, but the old trees, seasoned by the flame of summer lightning and hardened to tears, know it is nothing to be a tree, mute and heartless, just strong enough to carry a man until he turns to air. <clears throat> Uh, this poem is called African Postman. It's a poem for Ethiopia and a man I met in Ethiopia some years ago when I was doing some work with the BBC on, on Haile Selassie. And Selassie, for Rastafarians, is, is, is the return messiah. Um, a, a brief little um, tutorial I should give you just so that you, you, don't, you understand. So Judaism, in Judaism, the belief is that the messiah is is yet to come, right? So we're still waiting for the Messiah. Christianity believes the Messiah came and then went and he's coming back, right? So he's coming back real soon, right? And then Rasta believed that the Messiah came, went, and came back, this time in the presence of Haile Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, right? So briefly, that's the story. And so this is the story of a man who I met called Solomon Ephraim Wolf, and the poem is dedicated to him. African Postman. Son, who is that? Is the African Postman daddy? Burning Spear. East from Addis Ababa, and then south deep into the Rift Valley, I can hear the horns trumpeting over the flat-roofed acacia trees. See African women bend low with wood heavy on their backs. And the cows, goats, donkeys, mules, sheep, and horses snapped into obedient herds by sprinting children move along the roadside. Life happens here. I'm traveling to the land I have heard about, Sheshemani, the green place, 500 acres of jazz benevolence, and I know now that I long to hear the rootsman tell me how, despite rumors of his passing, the Nati keeps on riding, keeps on standing in the fields of praise to hold on to the faith of roots people. Brother Solomon, you put the name Ephraim on your head and carry the face of the true Rasta, the face of an Ashanti warrior, eyes deep under heavy lids and your skin tight as leather, blacker than black. I have met you before on the streets of Kingston, there where you trod to the hiss and slander of the heathen, you, natty dread, gathering the people's broken minds into your calabash. You carry it all, tell them, return to the roots, the healing shall take place. You are burning spears' voice into the fields of Teph. You tell me of the prophecy of Marcus, and I listen to you through the phlegm, through the gruff of your voice. Then suddenly, when I ask about the passing of the emperor, you rise up like a staff of correction, your voice reaching back to the mountains, your warrior self, your yardman greatness, and you speak a mystery of those who have ears but won't hear, who have eyes and won't see, and I know that this dread will one day stand in this soil and find his feet growing roots, that soon the earth will be darker for the arrival of Solomon. Let the heathen rage, let the doubters scoff, let this Ghanaian youth whose eyes have seen the face of Jesus Christ, let him too sit 
and marvel at the faith of the natty, for this African postman has forsaken father and mother and has come to stand before his imperial majesty to call only him father, so that the father might call him son, and the world will carry on its weary march, and the ibises will swoop in the Ethiopian dusk, and the smoke will rise from wood fires, and the night will come with news that the rootsman, after 400 years of being told he is homeless, has come home. Yes, Ja, has come home. Sons and daughters of his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, earth rightful ruler, without any apology, say, this is the time when I and I and I and I will come home. Yes, Ja, oh, come a hold the phone. Na le go. Na le go. Na le go. Reach. I come in search of diadem and scepter. I come in search of doddering old men. I come in search of the glory of warrior kings. I come in search of the burden of patronage. I come in search of the eyes that burned. I come in search of the body in the latrine. I arrive in a city that has expunged a hero gone to seed. Perhaps he stayed too long, or perhaps he's not gone, not quite yet. I come in search of the conquering lion. I come in search of the hubris of empire. I come in search of the ancient faithful. I come in search of the blasphemy of Rasta. I hold in me dusty questioning, seeking out the whisperers and the scoffers. It is raining in Addis. The air is thin. And I know only that these faces, these beautiful faces, are the faces of those uncertain of majesty. When man is God and God is man, Myth and magic walk hand in hand with blood and madness and decay. In this land, it is possible to hear the voice of God in the voice of the dead. Uh, this is a poem called Black Funk, and it's a poem from a collection called Wisteria. Um, and it's in a voice of a woman, so that might explain some things odd happening in it that <laughs> that might strike you as a slightly incongruous for a minute. Um, so I just want you to know that. Um, I interviewed African American women in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, they, they were average age in their 70s and 80s, and they told me the stories of their lives growing up in Jim Crow South. And um, these poems I wrote responding to these, these interviews I did uh, as a way to cope with them. Um, and you know, I, you know the, the, the interviews were published, and we did things with them, and it was great. And so we, the, the poems were performed. They were set to music. We did performances with them, and so on. So it was good. But this poem is, is one of those that comes out of it, and it's called Black Funk. The rigid of my jawbone is power forged in the oven of every blow I have felt. My water walk is something like compensation for a limp. Don't begrudge me my sachet walk, it's all I got sometimes. Cause I know the way you stare pale blue eyes like a machete edge catching the color of new sky. The way you barely whisper your orders, spit out the food, complain about my shuffling gait, snorting out my funky smell, find fault in each task I do, never right, never good enough, curse my children like dogs, cause I know you just hurtin', drooling your bitterness when my back is turned, when the shape of my black ass swings the way you hate, sashaying through this room of daggers. I know you're wondering what I've got down there in my belly, in my thighs. Make him leave your side, crawl out of his pale, sick skin, and howl like a beast at night, whimper like a motherless babe suckling on me, suckling on me. You can't hide the shame you feel to know I sometimes turn him back. I know you know it from the way he comes on you, hard and hurried, searching for a hole to weep his soul in. Yes, I turn him back when I want, and he still comes back for more. I got my pride sometimes. 
I know the way you try to read me, try to be me, can't be me, never be me, never feel the black of me, never know the blues in me, cause you never want to see you in me, even though we bleed together, finding each other's tidal rhythms, and bloat together like sisters, hoarding the waters of the moon together, so I sashay through your life, averting the blades with my leather skin, I abuse you, and when he balls, that is my pride at work, all I got sometimes. I'll cook your meals until he keels over, and you just have to take it. Because I took it with no fuss when he forced his nothing self on me, while my babies sucked their thumbs within the sound of my whimpering. I paid, baby. I'm just reaping what y'all done sowed. Tornado Child for Rosalie Richardson, an amazing woman, an amazing woman. I am a tornado child. I come like a swirl of black and darken up your day. I whip it up all into my wombs, lift you and your things, carry you to where you've never been, and maybe if I feel good, I might bring you back all warm and scared. Heart humming wild like a bird after early sudden flight. I'm a tornado child. I tremble at the elements. When thunder rolls, my mother, my mother womb trembles, remembering the tweak of contractions that tightened to a wail when my mother pushed me out into the black of a tornado night. I'm a tornado child. You can tell us from far by the crazy of our hair. Couldn't tame it if we tried. Even now I tie a bandana to silence the din of anarchy and these kaya thick plaits. I'm a tornado child. Born in the whirl of clouds, the center crumbled, then I came. My lovers know the blast of my chaotic given. They tremble at the whip of my supple thighs. Tornado child, you cross me at your peril. I cling to light. When the warm of anger lashes me into a spin, the pine trees bend to me, swept in my gyrations. I'm a tornado child. And when the spirit takes my head, I hurtle into the vacuum of white sheets blowing and paint a swirl of color streaked with my many songs, because I'm a tornado child. There's a sequence of poems in this collection that is the new work. And this is work that, um, uh, as Meredith said in the introduction, was written in response to the plays of August Wilson. And August Wilson is easily one of the top five um, American playwrights ever. It's just plain simple. Um, he's up there with Eugene O'Neill and um, Sam Shepard and David Mamet and that, 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 that crowd of dudes. Um, but he wrote 10 plays, each play representing a decade of the 20th century. And he planned to do that, to write the 20th century cycle. He wrote the 10th play, and then he died. Um, and they are amazing, magnificent plays. They've won major awards. He won two Pulitzers for his plays. He's won Critics' Desk, Desk Awards. He's won Tony Awards. He's won every award for every single one of those plays. Um, and as a legacy, we should read August Wilson's work. It's, it's that important and that, that amazing and that beautiful. So this is my homage to August Wilson in writing poems responding to his work. So I'm going to read um, a sequence of sonnets called Four Songs for Bernice. Bernice is a character from the play The Piano Lesson. And The Piano Lesson is a story of a family battling over a piano that has been passed from generation to generation. And it has been passed from generation to generation because a slave, a slave one of the ancestors of the family, carved out these wonderful bass reliefs on the, on the piano, these wood reliefs, really, on the piano. Um, and eventually, in the 1830s, the family, the ancestors, stole it from the, from the white family. Um, and, and now, in the 20th century, in 1920, it's 1930, the novel is set, they have to decide what to do with this stolen thing. One of, the, one of the ancestors, a son, the male, wants to sell it 
and go back south and plant and, and, and buy land. And the, the daughter, Bernice, wants to keep it because it's a legacy. It's a great dilemma. And the piano lesson is what that is about that dilemma. So it's just one of these classic moments. So these poems are for Bernice, who is the daughter. One, if she hits him, his arms dangling, makes a fist and pounds his chest on his shoulders with her open palm reaching for his face, like she wants to test him to see if he will flinch, if he will cry out his guilt, if she lets the tears fall, bawling out expletives in a shrill voice she never knew was there in the pit of her belly, then maybe afterwards, her arms aching, her skin slick with exertion, some sweet mercy will fall on her, and the man, her man, who they took from her, stole from her, might rest at last in peace forever. Two. All she knows are men, generations of men who come and go, leave you wondering if in God's creation there is a place called the blues where they go to find their hearts, to find the things someone stole from them, where they might chart the patterns of their tired old stories, where maybe a tender heart hand will heal them, send them back home to stay, to surrender to love's promise. But life has a knack of dragging them out again, leaving her waiting, waiting, waiting. Three, after a while, you turn the bitter taste of loneliness into something sweet. A manless home can be filled with a woman's praise song to Jesus. And know that holiness can be sweeter than a man's body close to you. And you can go when you want to go. Come in, don't have to find his clothes in the corner. Don't have to sit and count the hours he's gone. And you know he has women, so why pretend? You are free of guilt for jealousy. You learn to grow a tough callus against the enemy of your flesh. And sometimes, Jesus, you learn the weightlessness of love. Four. And this is for Maritha, her daughter. Maritha, never be ignorant of men. You got uncles, you got blood, your daddy's dead for being a man. Their burden isn't your burden, all you've got is charity, the Bible says, and good sense to know that you will love men and they will hurt you and make you grow big with the power of survival. Some sweet day, the hurting will leave their blood washed out by time, but until then, you must cleave tightly. Don't let them entwine you and drag you down deep. You've got to stay afloat, got to keep. OK, so <coughs> uh, I think I'll do one more poem, and then we can talk to each other, yes? OK? So this is the last poem that I'll read. And it's a poem called, If You Know Her. And um, it's, it's complete invention. And it's completely made up. It has no reference to anybody at all. OK? <laughs> Absolutely not. So. <clears throat> if you know her. If you know your woman, know her rhythms, know her ways, if you're paying attention to all these years, to her all these years, you will know how she comes and goes, how she slips away even though she's standing in the same place. You will know that her world is drifting softly from you, and she may not mean it because all it is is she's scared to be everything, scared to be finding herself in you every time, scared that one day she will ask herself all 40 plenty years of her, where she's been. If you know your woman, you will know that mostly she will come back, but sometimes when she drifts like this, something can make her slip, and then coming back is hard. If you know your woman, you can tell by the way she puts on heels and she does not sashay for you because it's not about you. 
how she will buy some leather boots and not say a word about it. And you only see it when she walks in one night and she says she's had them forever. And you, you will see the way she loses the weight and pretend it's nothing. But when she isn't seen you looking, you can see how she faces the mirror, lifts her chest to catch a profile, and how she casually looks at her ass for signs of life. If you know your woman, when you are gone, she will find things to do, like walk alone, go see a movie, find a park, collect her secrets, and you won't know because she's looking for herself. And she won't tell you that she wants to hear what idle men say when she walks by them, because what you say is not enough. If you know your woman, you know when she's going away, and you will feel the big hole of your love and you can't tell why she's listening and humming to tunes you did not know she heard before. And she will laugh softly at nothing at all. If you know your woman, you will see how she comes and goes. And all you can do is wait and pray she will come back to you. Because you know that your sins are enough for her to leave and not return. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.